Hello everybody. We're going to read two chapters today, chapter three and chapter four. Jan is on the train at the moment, heading to Wolverhampton. Chapter three is titled, My First Billet. When we got off the train, we were taken to the lawn in front of a large country house where some ladies stood behind a big trestle table and provided us with tea to drink and buns to eat. We felt very stiff after sitting for such a long time, but our journey was not quite over. Arrangements had been made to take us to houses or evacuees billets, as they were known, in the villages around this area. Some pu pupils went to Weobly some to Norton Cannon and Erdisland and Dilwyn. Mary and I were sent to Dilwyn, a very pretty village with black and white cottages set around a village green. On the green stood, stood an enormous white tent. We were taken into this tent and told to line up. Mary and I stood at the end of the line, holding hands and wondering what was going to happen to us. We didn't have to wait long. A noisy group of ladies came into the tent and walked up and down looking at us almost as if it was a cattle market and we were ready for, and we were for sale. They chose children to go and live in their houses and took them away until there was only Mary and myself left. Finally, a young woman who was later than the others rushed into the tent and looked at Mary. I was suddenly afraid that I would be left on my own and I said to this woman, we're together. Oh well, she said, I expect I can manage both of you you better come with me. She led us across the village green to a row of pretty colleges and to a row of pretty cottages and we were taken inside one of them. There were a lot of small children in the kitchen who looked at us without speaking but the lady smiled at us and offered us tea and cake which we ate gratefully. We were shown the earth clo closet outside the back door in case we needed to go to the toilet. In the countryside, where there was no water or drainage connected, the toilet was in a small shed outside. It did not flush, and earth was used instead of water. Later we were taken upstairs to where a double mattress was spread over the landing floor. This was where we were to sleep. Doesn't sound very nice, does it? I've put a rubber sheet over the mattress, said the lady, because we've been told that evacuees wet the bed. I was horrified. I had never wet the bed in my life, but of course I didn't know about Mary, and Mary said nothing. I won't wet the bed, I said very definitely. The woman made no reply to that. She just pointed out the wash basin and jug in the corner, below which there was a potty on a shelf, should we need it during the night. You'll wash yourselves there, she said. I hope you've got all you need. When it was time for bed, Mary and I were sent upstairs first and settled down under the sheet. The small children in the family then came upstairs and walked silently past us and went into one of the bedrooms. A light on the landing was left on so we could see our way round. As it grew dark, there was a lot of laughter coming up from the room beneath which was the kitchen. I found I could see between the floorboards if I rolled to the edge of the mattress. A group of men were sitting round the kitchen table drinking and laughing, filling their mugs from a large jug which they passed around. Mary was soon asleep, despite the noise, and I soon fell asleep too. In the morning when I woke up, Mary had already gone downstairs. I hurried to get dressed and joined her in the kitchen where we were given a big breakfast of bacon and eggs. Almost immediately a car drew up at the door and we were told to collect our belongings and get into the car as we were to be moved to another billet. If there was not enough room, children would be moved to another billet and there was very little room for all the people who lived in this cottage. There was no bed for us after all, just that mattress on the floor. The tiny bedrooms must have been very full with all the children in that family, but I think they were disappointed to lose us because it meant that they wouldn't get our extra ration. At that time, when a family took in an evacuee, they had their small rations to add to the family rations, which helped to make food go a little further, and they were also given a government allowance of ten shillings and sixpence to help with the expense of another mouth to feed. In 1940, butter, bacon, sugar, meat, fats and cheese were all rationed, and later on, even bread was on ration along with tea, biscuits, cereals, eggs, lard, milk and dried fruit. Only essential foodstuffs could be brought to our country by ship when we were at war because the ships could be sunk or bombed. 
There were no bananas, for example, until the war ended. Sometimes a few oranges became available, at the most twice or three times a year. But these were only supposed to be for the younger children. I really miss bananas, as mashed bananas with a sprinkling of caster sugar and evaporated milk out of a tin was a favourite for tea time. As the men went to fight, women took over their jobs, including working on the land, so we could still be fed. We even had to give in coupons to buy our clothes as the war went on. Rationing Here are some of the foods that were rationed during the war and in the years after the war. Amounts would vary from week to week, depending on what was available. Meals were cooked from scratch, so it was often difficult to make the rationed ingredients stretch far enough to feed everyone. Rationing was not lifted in Britain until 1954. Look there, I don't know if you can see. It's a list of different things. You can pause it if you want and have a look. It's a list of different things that could be rationed. Is there anything that surprises you there? Fifty grams of cheese a week. It's not that much actually. It's quite a small amount. It's quite a small amount indeed. Anyway, pause this if you want. Go back, pause it, and have a look. Let's move on to chapter four. We were taken by taxi to Little Dilwyn, which was only a short distance away, and Mary was taken to a farmhouse. A young farmer and his wife lived there with a new baby. They had no other children. A lot of farm buildings stood around the farmyard, including a cow shed. I was taken across the road to a pretty black and white cottage where I was welcomed by a young woman and a daughter. She was the wife of a farm labourer. They also had an older son, but I didn't see much of him. The girl, who was about my age, took me round to show me the chickens, and I helped her to collect the eggs. Later on, we went down a lane to bring the cows in for milking. She seemed to think I had never seen cows before, but although I never liked getting too close to cows, I certainly had seen many in the fields around Brightlingsea. I told her that my father had once been a farmer, but it was before I had been born, and we now lived in London. She gave me a stick and showed me how to smack a cow on its rump to get it moving as we went along the lane, but I kept well back. Up close, I found them quite frightening. Over at the milking sheds, Mary and I were shown how to milk a cow by hand and we were persuaded to try with a placid creature called Buttercup. I found the slippery feel of the cow's teats very uncomfortable and we only managed to persuade her to give a few drops of milk after our efforts. The farmer showed us how to go to the top of the cow's teat and then squeeze the teat as you pulled your hand down, but we were no good at doing this as our hands were too small compared to the farmer's big strong fingers. A long squirt of milk came into the bucket each time he showed us. Afterwards he dipped a cup into the pail and offered us a drink, but it tasted nothing like the milk from the bottle the milkman used to bring to our house. It was bubbly and warm, and we didn't like it. It made me wonder how it turned into the milk we were used to drinking. Twice every day the farmer had to milk his cows by hand. It must have been really hard work. After tea I helped the lady of the house to dry the dishes. She asked me about my last home and I was only too pleased to chatter on about my grandmother's house and her lovely garden and the stream and the waterfalls. She stopped washing up and looked at me accusingly and told me I was the biggest liar she had ever met as she had been told that I came from Poplar with the other children and Poplar was a poor place. Nobody lived in the place I had described. I was speechless at her outburst and for the first time I missed home and my mother. We only had a small backyard where we lived in London over the shop and I wished I had described that to her instead of my grandmother's house. I had to remember that I was part of George Green's school now from Poplar, so from then on, I kept quiet. Sometimes, when I wanted to be the same as everyone else, I would try to mimic the way they spoke. The children from Poplar spoke with what is known as a Cockney accent, but I came from another part of London and my accent was different. The children often said I spoke posh, just because I spoke with a Northwest London accent, but I was not posh in any other way, and their remarks hurt me. But try as I might, I couldn't speak with a Cockney accent, so I had to give that up in the end. My mother had packed a pencil, a pad, a lot of lined paper, and some stamped addressed envelopes so I could keep in touch with her. But the first postcard had been given to all the pupils and would be posted for them by the staff. Later, I went into the front room to write the stamped addressed postcard to send home so my mother would know I was all right. 
I was soon told the front room was kept for special occasions and I was expected to use the kitchen table. I had to learn fast from that from now on things would be very different to what I was used to at home. At bedtime, I was expected to share the daughter's bed with her. This surprised me, but there was nowhere else for me to sleep and she made no objection. The next day, Mary and I walked to Dillwyn where the large tent on the green served as a classroom. But without any books or pencils or a blackboard, we just played games and raced about on the grass. At home time, we had no idea which way to go. The signposts had all been taken down in case the Germans invaded and the hedges were very high, so we just plodded on. At a crossroads, a farm worker who was walking in the opposite direction asked us where we were going to and when we told him, he turned around and sent us in the right direction. We reached Little Dillwyn late in the evening, utterly exhausted, with the people we were billeted with wondering if we had got lost. After almost a week, we were told we were moving again as there was no school nearby which could accommodate all the evacuees. So we packed up our small belongings and got onto yet another coach. Gosh, there's a lot of travelling there, isn't there? It doesn't sound too comfortable at the moment for, for Jam. I will see you tomorrow for Chapter 5. Have a good day.